It's an honor to be talking to you via video. I wish I could be there in person, but I'm usually handcuffed to my desk working on the product. The WalkScore mission can be summed up by my t-shirt, which says, drive less and live more. And what our mission is, is to make walkability broadly defined, so that means the being near the people and places you love, having a short commute, being able to access your city on public transit and biking. We want to make that part of how people look for real estate. And so we've done a lot of work to get our scores and data onto other real estate sites. And we're now showing about 20 million scores a day across 30,000 real estate sites. So um, we're trying to make walkability how people find real estate online. What we're trying to do with our software is to communicate the benefits of walkability. Walkability is something that urban planners have been talking about for decades, but it hasn't really been part of how the average person finds real estate online. And so the way we define walkability is being close to the people and places you love, and that's what our walk score measures, having access to your city on public transit and, and via biking, so we have a transit score and a bike score, and having a short commute is also important. And so we let people search for places to live by commute time. So here's an example of how a consumer might use our website. They would go to walkscore.com and they might type in their address. This is the walkscore office address. And when you type in an address, you get a walk score, a transit score, and a bike score for that location. We also tell you other things about the location, like what are the nearby transit lines, or are there car shares nearby? Uh, and we also tell you about that neighborhood. So here's our neighborhood page where we calculate all of our scores at the level of an address, a neighborhood, or a city. And you can see that uh, our office is in a walker's paradise. We wouldn't want to be located anywhere else since we are walk score. And you can see that we rank neighborhoods against each other, so we sort of uh, can rank the most walkable, most bikeable, most transit-friendly neighborhoods. This is a great way to, um, to get people talking about walkability and what makes a neighborhood walkable. Um, we sort of show hot spots for eating and drinking where you have a lot of choices for restaurants. Uh, we tell you about uh, public transit and car shares. We have maps of bikeability. Uh, and we're starting to do more with um, crime since that's one of the most frequent feature requests we get from people is, okay, I know I, there's stuff to walk to, but is it safe to walk there? And when we think about safety, we think about um, not just safety from crime, but also pedestrian safety and safety from, from cars and car accidents. If you're looking for a place to live on, on walkscore.com, uh, we have a lot of different ways you can search for apartments. One of my favorite ways is by commute time. So I can say, I work at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I want to be able to get there in 30 minutes on public transit. Where can I live? And this is a map that shows um, where I can live uh, and still have a 20-minute commute to University of Washington, a 30-minute commute, or maybe a 40-minute commute. And you can see these areas over here um, light up as I increase the travel time. I can also say, maybe I have a roommate. He works in downtown Seattle. He wants to be able to bike in 30 minutes. Where can we live? And now we'll draw both of those commutes and um, this overlapping area is where I can have my transit commute to University of Washington, and he can have his biking commute um, downtown to Seattle. So it's an innovative way to, to search for a place to live by commute time. We also let you um, uh, do what we call the gotta have search, where you can say, I gotta have a coffee shop within 10 minutes, and I want to have a car share within a 10 minute walk and I want to have a grocery store within a 15 minute walk, where can I live? And here's a map of all the coffee shops, grocery stores, and car shares in Seattle, and the places you can live where you uh, meet all those requirements. Now let's go to a city uh, that has a good subway system. Seattle, unfortunately, does not. And um, what I can do in a city like Washington, D.C., is I can um, say, I want to live within a 10 minute walk of the subway stations, where can I live? And here's a map of every apartment within a 10 minute walk of a Washington DC subway station. So you can see how um, we're helping people find a place to live based on 
um, what's nearby, what their commute would be like, and how they can explore their city. We've also done a lot of work to get WalkScore onto other real estate sites. And so we have a set of APIs and widgets that lets other real estate sites add our data to their site. Now we're looking at a home listing on Zillow.com. Zillow is the number one real estate site in the United States. They have about 70 million monthly visitors. And here you can see that they have a walk score and a transit score on every listing. I was personally really excited when they added transit score because in the US there's still a perception that uh, public transit is for people who can't afford a car and, um, and I love the idea that every Zillow listing has a transit score uh, because transit is such an important part of walkability. Now let me show you, um, let me show you a, a peek underneath the covers of how, how WalkScore works. Um, and this is uh, my neighborhood in, in Wallingford, Seattle. And as I hover over different addresses in the neighborhood, you can see how all of the various scores change and you can see what, what makes up a walk score. So you can see that for every address, we are looking at hundreds of walking routes to all the nearby grocery stores, parks, errands, shopping, dining and drinking. And we're also calculating uh, intersection density, block length, and population density uh, on the fly. And so that you can get these maps that show where neighborhoods are more or less walkable. Uh, and we can do this very fast in a way that lets you compare addresses across cities or across the country um, in an equivalent way. And lots of cities have their own walkability studies or metrics, but you can't compare Portland's 20-minute neighborhood to, um, to Seattle's walkability metric, and WalkScore lets you compare those things. We've also been doing some work on letting people measure things like access and choice. So here's a map of um, what percentage of the Seattle population can walk to a grocery store in five minutes. Uh, it looks like it's currently 31%, and if I go up to 10 minutes, 69% um, of Seattleites can walk to a grocery store, and all the way up at 20 minutes, about 94% of the people can walk to a grocery store. Here we're looking at a map of um, how many restaurant choices people have in Sydney. And now we're looking at um, Sydney and all the surrounding suburbs. And people can walk to about 3.18 restaurants in five minutes. And if I go all the way up to 20 minutes, people can walk to about uh, 52 restaurants on average for Sydney and all of the outlying suburbs. But if I zoom in to just downtown Sydney, in five minutes people can walk to 116 restaurants. And as I slide this up to a 20 minute walk, people can walk to 1,121 restaurants in 20 minutes. And that's what people love about great cities. And that level of choice is what uh, makes cities such great places. And that's one of the ways we're trying to kind of get beyond just a score into the other aspects of, of walkability that make a city great. We also have been working on access. And so we did the first national ranking of food deserts in the United States where we algorithmically measured what percentage of the population in a city can walk to fresh food in a certain amount of time. And we're starting to see some cities like San Jose, California, use these measurements as a, as a performance metric to see how their city is improving over time. So San Jose is using our, our Choice Maps product to measure what percent of their population can walk to fresh food in, in five minutes, and 10 minutes, and then how does that change over time? Well, so one thing I've always wanted to do that we've just started doing is computing walk scores much more frequently and storing the trend data over time so that we can see where the walkability movers and shakers are in the United States. So, you know, if I look out my office window in Seattle, I see 20 cranes building mixed-use buildings. How much is that going to change the walk score in a Seattle becoming more or less walkable faster than other cities? And so that's going to be exciting data to look at in the future once we have it. Before we started WalkScore, I would hear real estate agents say things like, this house is very walkable, it's right on the golf course. You can walk right from your house onto the golf course. And we're trying to define walkability as being close to the things that you do on a daily basis so that you can live a car light or a car free lifestyle. 
And what's been most fascinating to me personally about putting a number on this is that it's enabled a lot of third-party research. So an economist in Portland named Joe Courtright did a study that showed uh, one point of walk score can be worth three to five thousand dollars in in the average American city. And it kind of makes sense, you know, if you go if you drive 30 minutes north of where I live in Seattle, you might have a walk score that's 50 points lower, and your house might be worth 150 thousand dollars less. Um, but this kind of quantitative analysis has tied walkability to home prices, to mortgage default rates, to um, health outcomes, and we're even now seeing uh, government agencies use walk score to do things like award low-income housing tax credits. So in Michigan and Illinois, they want to provide an incentive for real estate developers to build walkable low-income housing, and so walk score is now part of the application to get a low-income housing tax credit. The, the thing that's interesting to me geographically about walk score is that, you know, where I grew up in Topeka, Kansas, um, you know, the culture is different than here in Seattle where, you know, people talk about sustainability here in Seattle. People uh, are, are, you know, very concerned about climate change. People are driving their Priuses and riding their bikes. Uh, and, you know, that's not the culture in, in Kansas. And so what I like about Walk Score as research ties it to financial data is that there's more and more data that shows that uh, walkable homes and properties are better investments. So in a way, you now have people who may not um, care as much about the lifestyle benefits, but still want to make a good investment in, in their homes. And so that's where I think walk score in, in the Midwest or the South can have an impact because uh, maybe not everyone uh, cares about being able to ride their bike to work, but most people care about their bank accounts. It's very interesting to think about walk score in other, other countries. And what we've noticed based on the analytics of our website is that walk score is popular in countries that had a lot of post-World War II development. And it's obviously because those are the countries that have a mix of walkable urban places and sprawling suburban places. So walk score is popular in the US. Uh, it's, pretty popular in Canada and Australia. It's even popular in places like Brazil, which has had a lot of post-World War II development. Uh, walk score really doesn't make any sense in a place like Paris or Copenhagen or Amsterdam, because those cities are so uniformly walkable that you would think about walkability very differently there. Um, and so it's important to remember when you're thinking about walk score uh, on an international basis that it was designed to measure the differences between uh, say a big American city like Kansas City that has some walkable areas but also has a lot of very sprawling areas. Uh, it was not designed to measure the difference um, between uh, you know walking in one part of London versus another part of London where they're very uniformly walkable um, but the characters of the neighborhoods might be very different and the walkability issues will probably be more uh, about uh, micro scale walkability in terms of um, you know, store facades, crosswalks, pedestrian amenities, and the things that um, are hard to measure algorithmically because there are no national data sets yet on those things. Yeah, we've worked very hard to um, continue to improve the walk score algorithm to bring it in line with um, academic research. So we've worked with the walk score advisory board. We've done a lot of work with Larry Frank at uh, University of British Columbia, who's uh, been a, a walk, great walkability expert and partner for us. And um, the walk score now for every location is looking at hundreds of walking routes um, to all of the things you might walk to on, on a daily basis, you know, grocery stores, schools, parks, shopping, restaurants, etc. And we're also uh, doing an analysis of the underlying road network based on open street map data where we're looking at planning metrics like intersection density and block length and link node ratio. And so um, what you have now is a, is a you know, pretty sophisticated walkability analysis that you can compare on an apples to apples basis across, uh, across the country. So a walk score of 80 in Seattle can be compared to a walk score of 80 in Chicago, uh, and it means the same thing in terms of your ability to live a car light lifestyle.